Today I'm here with Ashley Lipinski. Ashley, thank you so much for coming on the channel. Well, thank you for having me. Well, I would like to kick this off and thank you so much for organizing this symposium. And I'd like you to explain to TFP TV what this is all about, because they're in for a real treat. All right, well, our symposium is called Arsenals of History, and the first one was last year. And it's really the first time ever in the United States that we've gathered together firearms museum professionals and academic historians that focus in firearms to get together to talk about some of the opportunities and limitations that occur when you have guns in your collections. Well, you know, the, the reason we do this symposium is because there really, there aren't a lot of conversations that go on specifically with firearms scholarship and museums in the academic community. And so really everything we talk about is pretty fantastic. This year though, specifically, we've been talking about ethics and that's everything from, you know, the mundane of, you know, who gets access to the collections all the way to what is the role, if any, of gun collections in the modern firearms debate. And so it's really, it runs the gamut and there's a little bit of something for everyone. A lot of people don't realize that firearms museums in the United States have to abide by the same laws that um, state, all the state, same state and federal laws as everybody else. Um, there is no firearms museum license, so we kind of have to work within that structure. And as a result, there are a lot of different firearms we can't collect. And so in that panel, we were kind of creating it more of like a white paper for what can we do to start becoming a repository um, as a you know, public museum that's not state or federal for uh, unregistered NFA and machine guns after 1986. Gotcha. And, um, the Cody Farms Museum is go undergoing a full-scale $12 million renovation and uh, we are in construction for that now, although we still have lots of guns on display and that'll be done next summer, June 2019. I'm Jim Sapika, I'm director of the NRA Museums. Jonathan Ferguson, I'm keeper of firearms and artillery at the Royal Armouries Museum in the UK. Michael Willemsen, I'm curator of firearms in the Dutch National Military Museum. Jennifer Tucker, I am a historian of technology at Wesleyan University. Professor Ben Nicholson from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Eric Goldstein, I'm the senior curator of mechanical arts and numismatics at the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation in Virginia. I uh, just gave a, a presentation on the NRA and its many uh, programs, and then on the NRA museums. I presented a, a paper at the symposium um, on dubious artifacts, so things of uh, uncertain origin, specifically the vampire killing kits, which I think a few people know about. And we have one at the museum, so I was kind of explaining where they come from or where we think they come from, and why we bought one. I give it a talk about the biggest project in years, that is the deaccessioning of 60,000 museum objects. Because sometimes museums have too much stuff in their depots and want to get rid of it. And how do you do that in an ethical, correct way? So the, the paper that I gave here was about some new research that I've been doing that looks at the historical evolution of photography and guns. So we know that people talk about shooting pictures and shooting guns, so we know the language is similar, but um, one of the things I'm really interested in is how the technology for cameras and guns evolve together. First is uh, teaching about firearms at uh, the university level uh, to bachelor and uh, master's students. At this conference, uh, I gave a lecture on the first day about the ethics or the lack of ethics of restoring old flintlock firearms, going too far, and even got into fraud and fake. Uh, there just has not been a forum before for the different firearms museums to get together and talk with each other. And we have so many unique concerns and unique problems and unique opportunities that getting being able to talk with folks from the other firearms museums and just uh, just the sharing of general ideas and, and uh, uh, swapping, swapping uh, concepts was, was the best part. This symposium is um, absolutely fantastic. Um, it's the, the only thing of its, uh, of its kind. Uh, museum, the museum profession has its own conferences and symposia, um, but there's, this is the only thing that there's that's ever been, as far as I know, for firearms curators and other museum professionals. It was nice to handle a Gatling gun once. I mean, there's not an opportunity you can get in Europe. 
I think it's going to be extremely beneficial because it's helping us form into uh, a, a group of people who are familiar with each other, each other's institutions, and having personal contacts and personal relationships with colleagues in other museums, both on, uh, in North America and in Europe and wherever in the world they may be, is, is only going to be beneficial to us all. I'm particularly fond of this case because it has Winchester revolvers. And you know, you think, well, what's that? You've got, you got Colt revolvers, you've got Winchester lever actions. There's a story, and I don't know if it's true or not, but if it's not true, it should be. The story is that uh, uh, Colt had started making lever action rifles and just gotten into that business. And the Winchester guys, it is said, walked into Colt's office and laid a prototype Winchester revolver down on uh, uh, Colt's uh, desk and said, now, do you guys really want to get into the lever action rifle business? Because we've been looking at the revolver business. And uh, supposedly, according, uh, according to the mythology at that point, uh, Colt decided, well, let's stick with revolvers and Winchester can stick with uh, the lever action rifles. Uh, this is a British pattern 1742 land service musket. And in my opinion, it's the most important surviving British musket of the French and Indian War. Uh, its wrist plate is marked to Sir William Pepperell's regiment, which was raised in America, in New York City, in 1754 and uh, completely surrendered and destroyed at Fort Oswego in 1756. This is the lone surviving musket from that regiment. About displaying and, and dealing with, in any way, um, modern firearms. We have very few on display for no particular reason. Um, and there's a lot more we can do. In 2005, we inherited the Ministry of Defence Pattern Room collection of what we would call modern firearms, 20th century, up to the present day, and we still collect up to the present day. But at the moment, we don't make best use of that collection. So to see the, the Glocks, you know, one of the, the landmark modern firearms with a polymer frame um, displayed in this way, it's interesting for me and makes me think about what we can do back home. What I like about this is the, the struggle with making an instrument uh, and uh, designing a piece of ammunition simultaneously. And of course for the volcanic uh, uh, rifle and pistol, it's a self-consuming -con uh, round uh, that the percussion cap and the uh, powder charge is tucked into the back of the, what you might call the mini ball cavity. Hunt rocket ball was, was before that. Uh, sadly, there's no uh, pieces of ammunition for that. But Behind me you see a Metzlock gun that was made for the Dutch army in the arsenal of Emden. So there's a clear Dutch connection. And besides this, you can see the pictures with the gun exercise, which is also has a Dutch origin. It was the first rifle exercise that was ever printed and distribu distributed from Holland over the whole world. So 